where we came from. We uh, worked with our uh, application programming interfaces, and this was allowing us to connect a, uh, a our Python script with a server that was dedicated or that was explicitly designed for providing structured data in either JSON or XML were the two ones that we worked with mostly to a client system. That is awfully handy uh, when an API exists. In situations where the only way that we have access to the information is via a web page designed for a browser, uh, the Python world and uh, the Python has actually become a language whose web scraping modules are um, cool enough that it's become a very common data data um, data pipeline process is saying, well, I can write code that acts like a person in a browser, but is actually a Python script. And so that process is known as web scraping because we are going to be interacting with data that was not explicitly designed for a Python script, but rather designed for a browser tab. And that involves a direct interaction with the raw source code behind a web page. So what I'd like to do for about, um, probably take about a half an hour, is give you a crash course in HTML fundamentals and actually design a very simple web page so that you can see how it works and then we'll try scraping it and interacting with that uh, library called Beautiful Soup. Um, so what I'd like you to have open is our web scraping module right here. Um, and again, I got there by reloading my schedule page uh, by hitting F5 on Windows and Linux, hitting web scraping, and then um, I've got the main resources we'll be working with um, are right here. So what I want to direct you to is uh, a couple of key resources. The first is, I'm, I'm sorry that the order on these is not the the most ideal from a lesson structure, is the Mozilla Foundation's Learn Web Development page. And I, I right-clicked or middle-clicked to open in a new tab. And then for those of you that are techie, um, RFC 2616 is HTTP 1.1, the actual specs uh, uh, that we are currently on. Oh, wait, did I not update that? Oh, no. That's a broken link. Let's see. Well, now we got to learn how links work. Um, hypertext 1.1. Okay, let me jump in here. So let me update this quickly. Okay, uh, hit F5 again. <laughs> so what is going on when you're hitting F5? Your computer is interacting uh, with a web server. So let's think about uh, the World Wide Web. Um, I need to think of what the right... Uh, let's do this. My computer, one second, it's stuck. Okay, good. So um, approximately what year do we think of as the internet emerging? When do, you, when do you place the internet? When did we start having computers talk to each other? Technically the 70s. When yep. military's yep. network started? Yep, late 60s, early 70s. So definitely um, by the early 1970s, we were having computers interact uh, in the sense of we could um, we could connect um, connect computers running compatible uh, operating systems uh, to one another. And so this often involved uh, remote logins uh, via a um, via a dedicated data network. Um, so, the important thing here was that these were, uh, this was a highly coupled 
system or a strongly coupled system, meaning when your network, when your computer was on the internet, it had to know exactly how to interact with the operating system of its compatible system. So there was, um, uh, there were sub sub networks uh, which were very incompatible with one another uh, because they were running different operating systems. They were on different hardware architectures, and they and for that reason they could participate in the same physical data layer of the network of co connected over copper, but they were unable to talk to one another. Um, it wasn't until the uh, late 80s and the early 90s that we came up with what or I shouldn't say we when a group of computer scientists and physicists emerged with the idea of the World Wide Web. Um, so the World Wide Web is an is an early 1990s phenomenon. So we would say that the web is a um, the web runs on a protocol runs on a on the hypertext transfer protocol. Uh, which is a subset of the internet with a capital I. Um, so what we're talking about is a technology that is part of the internet, but is a particular protocol on that internet, which is how do we transfer structured text on, uh, from computer to computer. And so this jumps us into history. So um, uh, the actual first web server and the first protocols, the first tests of the protocols took place in Europe, in CERN. Um, I used to be quite an interested person in physics, um, and so let's uh, take, a, take a trip uh, over to Switzerland. Um, and physicists are quite a tenacious bunch. Um, and one of the major particle physics laboratories is located in Switzerland, CERN Labs, there it is. So the CERN building, we are over here in Switzerland. Uh, look at all those are the pretty mountains. Um, put your hand up if you've been to Switzerland. Has anyone been to Switzerland? Oh, Zach's been, oh cool, we've got several folks. Is it as pretty as people say it is? I have not been. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's really nice. And right at the foothills of some major mountains is a major particle physics laboratory. Look at this. What you're seeing, um, and I think I can even get the satellite on, um, there it is. Um, what you're looking at is a, a satellite view of an underground particle physics research facility that uh, on the inside looks like, uh, has halls that look like this. Or do they give us the... Um, I want to show you the particle accelerator. Um, uh, it's important for you to know where these roots are since we use this all, all day long. Um, particle accelerators are tools that are designed for researching rudimentary and pure physics. And we have one at um, a Fermilab in Chicago. And there, the other one is this lab in, in Switzerland. Uh, they involve using magnetic, magnetically controlled beams of particles traveling at near the speed of light, and we can smash them together, and we smash them together in things that look like this. What you're actually looking at is um, a, these are humans. Uh, these are humans standing inside a collision detecting device. So here's a better picture. So. Um, Take a look at this. is This will this is blowing your mind, I hope. Um, so here's where the actual particle beam would be traveling in the center. And if you take several of those beams and you hit them together at a certain angle, they hit, the particles collide, and they create new particles, and they combine, and they break apart. And then what you're seeing here are probably some of the most specialized and highly sensitive electronic detectors that the world has ever engineered for detecting the energetic fields associated with those collisions. And so the World Wide Web was created by a physicist working in one of these laboratories, 
and the desire was to be able to exchange in convenient form the uh, findings that they were generating uh, using the CERN particle physics collider. Um, and so the roots of the web are in technical document exchange, meaning how do we effectively allow people to hop from document to document and store those documents in a location in which we're not sending people the original copies of documents and then having to resend them a copy of a document every time we make a change, but rather let's store the document in a central place and then provide others a, uh, a, a tool, a web browser that can parse that document and view it in a human readable form. And this is the first uh, web server that was hosting documents. Um, it has a great little um, inscription on it. Let's see if we can zoom in. I think it's do not turn off. Yes, do not, do not power down. <laughs> do not power down. You can see the little CERN logo um, uh, here. So uh, this was the first tool that was designed for um, providing those documents to other physicists around the world that were using uh, that were interested in in this in this type of document exchange, and so at the in the in the first articulation, there was very little sense of where the web could become, which is became a, an actual shared platform for entire applications. Now that we have JavaScript and web browsers that function almost like operating systems, um, and so the World Wide Web rests on a protocol called the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which specifies a way of creating tags and de declarations around content for how that content should be displayed and how that content should be transferred between systems. Um, and so what I'd like to do is actually invite all of us to make a very simple web page and see how a browser works uh, in this regard. Um, and so uh, what we'll ask you to do is open your favorite text browser, text editor. It could be your, if you're using Spider, you could certainly use Spider. Um, I'm gonna use uh, Sublime Text since that is my preferred editor. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is have open that, uh, that link to um, the Mozilla Learn Web Development. So again, I got there by clicking on my Mozilla Learn Web Development page. Uh, while people are getting there, does anyone have any uh, other comments or questions on the roots of the World Wide Web or particle accelerators? Okay. Um, I think you're all still out there. Uh, everyone's muted. It's kind of like floating. I think this would probably what it would be like if I was ejected into space and asked to teach a class. You'd be just floating and talking. And things would just get absorbed. So I um, don't see any protests coming up. So this is good. Um, so for your juggling reference. Juggling screens. Pardon? I said we're just juggling screens as you yes, are. Yes, so much screens. Um, I didn't mean that antagonistically. I, I, I apologize if that came across. Um, you're, it's wonderful to work with all of you. Um, there are um, the Mozilla Developer Network and the Mozilla Foundation is the organization that has assembled and has become the, I think it's probably not a formal role, but they are, they are the, the organizing lead for maintaining documentation on the current status of the hypertext markup language, which is what HTML stands for. So let's uh, learn a little bit. Let's add to our, our notes here. Um, so we would say that the World Wide Web runs on HTTP. So HTTP is the hypertext uh, transfer protocol. <clears throat> One interesting note about this is that we, the current HTTP version is still 1.1 which was the initial stable version of HTTP. Uh, and uh, I remember growing up, my father worked, um, uh, he worked at IBM doing support for um, 
uh, chip design engineers, and he would always say, oh, uh, computers change too fast, I, it's so overwhelming, and things are always moving and changing, but consider that a computer running in the CERN lab in 1991, uh, or early 90s, running HTTP version 1.1, would still be able to communicate perfectly well with any other computer on the web today in 2020. Uh, and so, this is, I guess this is 99 really, so I wasn't exactly right that it was the first one. Um, no, since initiative in 1990. Um, so to think that this was a standard, this, this was well thought out enough that the original standard has not changed uh, in 30 years is, a, is quite a testament to uh, the foresight that this particular group had. Um, and so we're working with a technology that is extremely robust and extremely well documented. Um, so HTTP, are, we would say that this is, uh, we could think of HTTP as the uh, rules for transmitting uh, data on this network. And then HTML is the hypertext markup language which is the uh, format for encoding uh, most or encoding documents exchanged on the network, on the World Wide Web using HTTP. So we would say, I am transferring an HTML document on HTTP, on the hyper, using the hypertext transfer protocol. And so, the Mozilla Developer Network maintains an extremely, uh, the most uh, complete version of the current status of uh, web language. And over the course of the next um, 15 minutes, I would like to make sure that we know what is meant by HTML, what is meant by CSS, which is the styling language, and then the, uh, the dark and dirty JavaScript uh, client-side scripting which has become its own beast entirely, um, and will be the um, uh, the unruly stepchild of scraping because right now there's not uh, JavaScript is still uh, a page that's overly JavaScripted is still a a bit of a it will it will be an impediment to scraping at our levels, and I am not familiar with scraping. I don't know if Beautiful Soup has a whole bunch out there for trying to wade through JavaScript, that would be a different, a different world. So um, what I, with this open, um, I'm just going to have us make a, a hypertext markup language document. Um, and then I'll explain a little more about how it's different than a programming language. So um, at, its, at its base, we're going to make the absolute simplest uh, document that we possibly can. And so I'm going to jump in where it says, uh, getting started with the web, your very first website. Um, and so we want to come down here to HTML, uh, introduction to HTML, getting started with HTML. OK. Um, this is, let me get a link to this exact page. So here's me updating HTML. HTML is based on a, a, the use of tags, which are uh, alphanumeric characters. In our case, these are always alpha characters. Text, alphanumeric text encoded or surrounded in carrots that um, sandwich values around it. So I'm going to say, so what I'm doing here is I'm going to say, um, the um, where to start uh, so what I'm doing is I'm surrounding I'm gonna make a link so what I want is I want the text HTML basics to become a link to this page so what I did was I grabbed the universal resource locator which is a major specification, a major part of the hypertext transfer, hypertext transfer protocol is how do we encode the location of documents uh, on the web? And you have enough experience building URLs for your API 
uh, that you're familiar with how uh, how important it is that those are exactly right. Those are pathways to a server, and then once we get that information to the web server in this case, the rest of that URL is parsed by whatever the insides of that server may be to get us to a document that we want. And so what I'm going to tell the uh, web script here is I would like this text to be an anchor tag. So A is the anchor, the, the um, tag for anchors, which are known as links. And then within those tags, we can specify attributes. So this is a key value pair. So this is hyper reference href, and then the key is href, and then the value will be this URL that I just grabbed. Um, and then I close out the the uh, attribute, and then I close um, I close the tag, the a tag, and then I'm going to uh, the a tag actually has an open and a closing, or the a element has an open and closing tag. So I'm going to surround the words HTML basics with the anchor tag, and my closing tag is the same as the opening tag, but with a leading forward slash before that same tag name without any spaces. So um, what I'm going to have us do is build a little uh, model web page once you get to this page. So now if I come back to my scraping, if you need to get into there, you can click that link right into getting started with HTML. So here's what I was just explaining. Um, Hypertech or HTML is not a programming language because it's not encoding logic and it's not being executed on a processor, but rather it is being interpreted by code based in the browser for how to display and how to organize data on a page. So tags have uh, or elements have opening and sometimes closing tags, and those tags can then also have um, uh, those tags can be nested inside one another, and um, then we can start styling those tags to do all sorts of uh, fancy displays. So let's let's go ahead and make ourselves a uh, a web page. So what we'll be doing is we'll be building nested tags uh, upon nested tags in order to provide the browser with some basic information about how to display a page. So I'm going to make this my web page. So we start with um, telling the browser, hey, what I'm working with is an HTML file. So we start with an HTML tag. And then I'm going to give myself a little breathing room, and then I'm going to close that HTML tag. And so at its basic level, we declare that this document is going to be in the hypertext markup language. And I'm going to go ahead and save this file so that we can um, access it on a browser. So I'm going to um, uh, find a logical spot to save it. Um, in my case, I'm going to save it locally. And again, for some of you who've done web stuff, this is uh, very basic. If you don't want to do this with me, you're welcome to go out and look for um, a web page that has data that you want to try to scrape um, if you're bored to tears out there. Um, so I'm going to put it in here. Let's do, um, I'm going to make a website about particle accelerators, so I'm going to call mine particle. And important here is that we're going to include the extension um, .html. Uh, the extension .htm is also acceptable, but is non-conventional by this stage. So I'm going to name my file. It's important that it has a .html extension, and um, save it somewhere that you can find it again. So now on, on my sublime text, I, uh, it has, no, it has um, picked up on the .html, look how smart it is, 
and is now um, shading with me, uh, giving me some uh, syntax shading. Um, so within here, we've got a, uh, a head element. So we start by, um, we're going to have everything nested. So because my head element is inside HTML, that's going to get indented. And in my text editor, I can easily do my closing tags just with a, um, an alt period if you're using Sublime. Um, so we're going to start by giving our uh, website a title. So you can either uh, work with me or it'd be more interesting if you want to make a, a simple website about uh, a content of your, of your interest. So um, I'm going to call mine Particle Physics. So we could think about this as a series of nested boxes um, if we wanted to. So um, visually, if we were if we wanted to visualize this, If we wanted to visualize what's going on, what we're what we're doing is making nested components using um, using HTML. So we've got um, we've got our HTML document. Of course, it's not going to be in there. And then, oh, I'm not going to try that, sorry. Um, so after we make our head, we then can give the browser, OK, we have a formal title to our document. And now we can start giving it content. Um, so the first thing to experiment with is just the basic markup of headers. So what the most basic header is is an H1, so header 1. And what the HTML specification allows us to do is uh, engage in a whole set of basic document formattings without having to worry about exactly how this heading is displayed in your browser, but rather to say, I don't care exactly, you know, this isn't PDF, this isn't, um, this isn't final copy for Time Magazine. This is saying, I need it to be bold and I need it to be pretty big. This is the top header. So. I'm, um, we could say, a journey into particle physics. Um, and so I want you to experiment a little with uh, how the headers work. So we've got headers going all the way down to level eight. And so um, I could make a little subheader. So again, what I'm doing is I'm sandwiching data in between an opening tag H1 and its corresponding closing tag, which is H1 with the leading forward slash. And then we'll see that the browser will parse this into uh, readable document formatting. Um, so I've got some headers. Um, and let's also a basic unit of text would be the paragraph, which is the P tag. So we can say uh, So I just want you to have a little bit of content, and then we can start playing with uh, the other parts of HTML. Uh, 
Um, white space in between uh, tags and such will be uh, ignored by the, the browser. Um, so now that we have a little bit of content in here, uh, we can then feed this into a browser. So this is kind of fun because um, ordinarily in browsers, we are used to uh, navigating to a website. In our case, we're going to open a file, which is actually not very easy to do. It, in fact, the open does not even come up in um, my browser tools. You actually have to do a control O or a command O to give it a file that's local because browsers aren't normally viewing local files. So I went to a browser, any browser you want, absolutely anyone will be happy to ingest our web page. And then I'm going to navigate to my uh, my web my website my HTML page so I'm gonna jump in find it here ah look at that so as soon as you have uh, made a page and open in a browser um, please raise your hand on online on your zoom Whoa, you're lightning fast. Whew. If I was standing next to them, I'd be blown away. Wow. This is great stuff. Um, I, I make websites for a living, and I find it fun to make every website. I think the idea of markup is really clever and really cool. Um, so as you're getting to that point, I'll just um, excogitate for a little bit. So remember, um, I didn't specify a font. I didn't specify a font size. There's a whole bunch of, um, there's, there's actually the, the base style sheet is embedded in each browser. So some of you, I bet I would, I'd put money that uh, um, Safari does not default to this serif font uh, on their classic style sheet. Um, would anyone be willing to share their, um, share their screen and show us what they've got? Since uh, we've got a few people still getting, getting together. Those of you that rose your hand, would anyone like to like to share? It's a lot more interesting when it's not just me. Eric, want to share? Brandon, Alex? I can share it. I'm just looking for where to share. Yeah, it should be a, a green box with an up arrow. Share screen. There we go. All right, there you go. And here comes Paula. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> On the same subject again, right? Yep. Uh, and then can we see your markup? Sure. Let's see where we got it. The rice and bean pear, half the world. Open, okay. Choose another app. Okay. All right. Come on. That's that's a sigh of a of a long day of computer problems. <laughs> Thank you. It has been. It has been. I'm just trying to open it with a with a darn uh, All right. So I think I. All right. Let me just do it this way. Oh come on! All documents, all files, and I named it particle. Whoops! There you go. Oops, backwards, zoom in, I give up. Anyway, that's what you got. Thanks, Paula. No problem. And if you could release your share, that would be helpful. I'm trying to get there, thanks. Whoops. Uh, no, how do we? Here we go, here we go, here we go, come on. Oh, man. How do I do this? 
Uh, it should be at the top. You should have like a stop share. Uh, yeah, right. All right, come on, stop share. Jeez, this this is this is the screen. So stop share. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so uh, great, and again, if you does anyone have any quick questions, please type those out in the um, group chat. We've got lots of uh, familiar techie folks uh, that could help if you're having problems. Um, a couple of things I want to note that's uh, kind of nice for um, it's kind of a refreshing thing for folks in Python and programming is the uh, HTML uh, specification is very uh, uh, it's not a programming language, so it's not trying to compile or interpret commands into a specific outcome from the processor. And what that allows it to do is it allows it to be a lot more flexible with junk that it doesn't understand. And the HTML standard is, if I don't understand it, take a best guess. So if I just come here in my, my markup, and if I just put in some junk in between the head and the body, So if I just put junk in there, if you just put junk in Python, it doesn't work. But if you put junk in HTML, it says, well, you know, I'm not sure what, it, what they meant by that, but it's text and I know how to display text, so it just dumps it on the screen, um, which is uh, kind of nice from a standpoint of you're not going to wreck an entire page by making a little typo, whereas in Python or certainly in, in compiled languages, one, la one lack of a statement closure means that the entire program doesn't work. So we've got some flexibility going on. Okay, so let's, let's keep uh, trugging through this. A couple of important things next, which is the main, one of the main things that we'll want to do is work with, um, with links to other pages. So um, I definitely want to get a link to the CERN laboratory, and I also like to put some media in here. And I want you to see how you can start connecting data uh, connecting pages on the World Wide Web very easily. So let's go ahead and find a website that you'd like to link that's related to your content. If you're doing um, particle physics with me, then uh, you could join me uh, over in Switzerland. So I'm actually going to look up um, CERN Labs. And again, if you're viewing it in a browser and the URL is visible in the location bar, the HTML system will uh, allow you to make a link to it. And so CERN has a very spiffy, um, a very spiffy web page. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the uh, URL from uh, their about page, and I'm going to drop it in my sample web page. So um, what we want to do is we want to enclose the text that we want to create the link out of. So I want to, so let's start with the most basic thing. So I need an anchor tag around it. Now, an anchor tag can be to a local position inside this very page, or it can be a link to any other internet routable location. Um, think about how dramatic this is. They created a specification that says with with one, a one character tag and then a single key value pair, href, I can easily allow a user to load a page from any other connected computer on the entire World Wide Web. Um, it is, we're so used to it that I think it usually doesn't come across very dramatically, but in my mind, it's extremely dramatic. Um, so I just pasted in the URL. Notice that um, when I copied and pasted from my browser the uh, the leading HTTPS came with me from the uh, location bar. Uh, browsers and computers have been trying to hide things from users for a long time and one of the things they hide from them is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash. I think they have a belief that people 
will will like go into seizures or break out in hives if they see a forward slash and then another forward slash. What does it mean? Um, so it's very in my mind, it's sad that we don't have enough faith in users that they can they can read this uh, to see that this is in fact a document uh, accessible via the hypertext transfer protocol over encrypted networks. Um, that's that's in there and it's encapsulated by that little um, the little lock tag which gives you access to the certificate. Um, but it, it needs to come along with you. So if it didn't come along with you, you'll need to add it. Um, so notice what I did. I um, added it as an attribute. This is all inside that anchor tag. That first anchor tag includes the hypertext reference. And so then all the text that is from uh, the end of that first anchor to the end of the, the, the closing tag will become the link. So I'm going to save that. And then I can just come right back to my sample page, which is here, and hit our best friend, F5. Um, and then I see that my default link showed up. So again, the, your browser has embedded in it a default style sheet for how do I display a link? Well, it's going to underline it. And because I have visited CERN, it sees it in my history, and it made it purple. Um, so this is a visited link. Um, so I can, I always want to test it. So I'm going to click it and there I am at the CERN page, which should load faster because I just loaded it. Um, so let's experiment with a little bit more with, um, uh, uh tags. Um, as programmers, sometimes you may want to clean up your HTML a little bit. So remember that, um, Return characters in your markup are not automatically interpreted as such by your browser. So if you want to make uh, code that's easier to read, um, you can insert more breaks in your code so that it's easier to see uh, your, your markup. So I'm going to put some extra space in there um, so that my anchor tag can be, can be dedicated. Um, so I would, I'm just going to put all that text in there. Um, so one thing that we can do is if we want that link to open in its own tab automatically, we can add a, another key value pair. In this case, it's the target. Where should I open this link? And if I tell it to open it in a keyword underscore blank, it will open that link in a new tab. So I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to save it. And then notice when I come back here, my return characters that I put in are not going to show up um, on my display. But it will work because now I opened my CERN link in the new, in the new tab. <clears throat> so you can have a whole bunch of key value pairs in any given tag. And this is important because when you, as you become web scrapers, you'll be asking Python to, you can ask it for information about tags, or you can ask it for the data inside tags that are given certain, um, given, that have certain um, attribute tags. And class is the main one that we'll get to in just a second. Um, the final thing I want to uh, show you is how we can grab media and put that on your page. Um, so I'm going to come here to Wikipedia and use um, some uh, publicly available uh, images. So if I want to include this beautiful shot of the uh, accelerator, um, I can check that this is, in fact, Creative Commons public domain. So I'm happy to link to it. Um, you'll notice that I am, um, I'm going to click the, the media link so that my URL ends in an image extension. So I want you to find an image, and you want you can find it online. I encourage you to find it via Wikipedia, because Wikipedia is a home of the public domain of images and Creative Commons licensed images. So find an image related to your content. Again, you want to navigate so that your URL includes the is, is to that actual file, that actual JPEG file.
And then I'm going to grab that URL and um, I'm going to stick it right underneath my paragraph. And so I'm going to say um, H2 um, And so now I'm going to use an image tag. An image tag is an interesting one because it doesn't need a closing tag. Um, it's what's called a self-closing tag. And I'd have to read the specs. You don't, I don't include the closing backslash because it doesn't have to be there. Um, so what we're going to say is, hey, image, or hey, browser, I've got an image for you. And browsers say, ah, I know images. Um, which image do you want? Well, I'm going to tell you the source of the image is actually going to be the World Wide Web. So I'm going to say, um, this is my image tag. The source SRC is a image file found anywhere online. Um, part of the HTTP protocol is if it's an image source, um, if I put a link into some shady Shady JavaScript or some horrible virus, it's very safe because the browser is going to say, I will only interact with it if it is a known image file that I know how to ingest. So uh, the protocol maintains so stable or maintains its stability because it's it's secure by default, which is if, if it's not an image, it's not going to make it to your computer. It's not going to save it. It's not going to run it. It's not going to send it to your processor. It's going to do nothing with it. Um, so if it's not an image file, it just won't display it, um, and which is why we include the alternate attribute. So if for some reason the Wikipedia, Wikimedia takes that image down, um, I can say, I can include text that will show up in its place. Pretty Arial, A-R, Arial view of CERN. And then um, it's a good practice to give an image a width or a height. Um, you generally don't need both because it'll end up changing the dimensionality of the original image. So if you give it one or the other, it will uh, keep the original size ratio and scale it to whichever you specify. Uh, so I'm going to say make it 600 pixels wide. So again, this is a case in which there is a tag that has, I'm not enclosing anything. Um, I believe the specification allows you, actually it might not. Um, sometimes you'll see it written with a backslash close. Um, I don't, again, I don't know if that's actual spec or not. You don't need it. So not every tag, not every element requires a closing tag. So now if I do a control S on that and come back to my particle physics. Oh, that is so cool. Look how cool that is. So notice this is a local file, but because it's in a browser, the browser is designed to happily go out and get a file. If it's a universal resource locator, it'll go grab it. It'll go get it. Um, as soon as you have an image displaying, can you uh, throw your hand up there so I can see how we're doing progress-wise? Oh, you're all so quick. And again, if you're having problems, just jump jump on the group chat and say, help me. Does anyone have any um, troubleshooting things that I might be able to help with as a group that might be catching people up? Are people without their hands up? Are they? Are you doing okay? Can I? Can I move on? Getting there.
So we're having um, some trouble with the original page. Always loads first, then the image. So um, one thing to check is check the URL. It might be the case that you have linked to this page, which is the wikimedia.org CERN media file. I have a feeling that you probably are linking to that one. Um, and that's, that might help with Drew's. Okay, great. Um, so if, you're, if your photo isn't going, uh, checking the URL is fine. Um, it's not critical that you make it go as long as you see that there are tags. And the reason I mentioned this is that it m you might be wanting to grab um, image source tags uh, from your scraping. So I think it's, it's good to, to try that. Um, so if you, I can help troubleshoot um, the image. Um, if, as long as your alt text is showing up, then you've kind of grabbed the, the spirit of this little exercise. Um, so again, I'm sorry I can't slow down and, and, and help everybody. So the next thing I want to do is uh, introduce the class system. I, I don't think this is a, I hope this doesn't feel like a misuse of time. I think it will help you be better scrapers. Um, the, uh, one of the key ways that we're going to snake into pages and find things that we want to get, um, I'm going to go ahead and lower people's hands since we're moving on, um, is the, the styling process is also a way that content on pages is, uh, is categorized in a way that we might want to scrape it. And so this introduces us to the, um, the notion of uh, CSS, which is cascading style sheets. So the, there's a, a sub language called CSS, which stands for uh, cascading style sheets. And uh, this is designed for providing browsers with uh, formatting information beyond the built-in style sheet included with each browser. So Chrome has the default style sheet that says I'm going to make H1s, whatever font size this happens to be. Um, so let's take a moment and um, jump into the back end of this of the page that you've just been building. So with the page loaded, go ahead and hit, hit F12, which is the magic, um, the magic uh, developer tools shortcut. Uh, and I want you to see that the HTML Explorer on here is really useful. And the fact that we have a very simple web page here will help us understand this tool a lot better. Um, so I hit F12. Uh, if you're on a Mac, uh, you should help each other because I'm not sure what it is on a Mac. It might be Command F12. It might be something else. Um, sometimes you can find it in here. Under more tools, developer tools, control shift I looks like is another um, another pathway into that. So what I'd like you to do is hit the elements um, component of that page of the developer tools. And notice there's our HTML. And what's really cool is that um, if you when you have the developer tools open, as you hover over the HTML in the dev tools, it shows you that particular element on the page. It highlights it, which is uh, a key thing that we're going to want to do when we get to a website that we want to scrape stuff from. And some websites these days are so complicated that it's nice to do something simple like this one. Um, so. It actually looks like the way, you'll see that the way that it displayed my paragraph is, uh, is kind of yucky because I had, um, I had a, a, I put in those extra spaces for my display and it, it 
is included in there somewhat, but the browser, when the browser interprets this, it just chops out all that extra space. So what you'll see is that you can see the nesting by, uh, by default in the browser. So I can expand my components. There's my title. Notice that my title made it up into my, um, my tab. Oh, function plus on Mac. Um, thanks. Uh, Zach, that's very helpful. Um, so one thing that I want you to note is that everything on your page is, is a box. Um, it's almost, it's, it's base level model is called the HTML box model because what you're seeing is uh, if you click any one of those tags, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here on my dev tools. Um, so go ahead and click one of your headers. And over on your right, so uh, one thing that I did that might be helpful for you is I changed how I'm displaying the dev tools. You might find it useful. I think most of you probably comes up like this. Um, I would suggest jumping down to the settings and then I, I just like to uh, pop it out. So undock to a separate window. So now these are linked at the hip. Um, so look what we're seeing. That this header one has these display characteristics. So what we're seeing, I think I showed this to you before when we worked with dictionaries, which is, look what we're seeing, key value pairs. These are the specifications that were built in from the default user agent style sheet, which is me in my browser is the user agent. So the browser came with this pre-embedded thing of saying header ones are font size 2M, which is roughly twice the size of a non-header font. Um, notice that it comes with these margins which are the uh which is shows up on my computer as the tan outline so these are the basic uh formatting uh display components that were specified by the browser default but what css does css this is css over here css is the tag names this is called a selector it's the tag name and then a list of rules for how to display any H1 tag. And you can see that on the developer tools, I can tinker with this. So if I come to element.style in my dev tools, I am adding um, style information. The reason it's called cascading style sheets, if you imagine a cascading waterfall that starts at the top and then the second tier is only including what comes down from the top and so forth. So the way it works here is the CSS that's lowest down on this list uh, is overridden by anything that comes higher in the list. So if I, I can override the user agent, so if I, if I say font size colon and say 6M, whoa, whoa, ah, look at that. So what I just did was I wrote some CSS and look, it crossed out the user agent style sheet because I have a higher precedence selector, which is the element itself. I gave, this is saying all headers get a font size of this. And then what I just wrote is saying, no, 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 this particular H1 is 6M. And so an element specific styling always overrides a um, uh, a tag specific styling. So um, we can, all of the CSS is at our disposal, including uh, color, which is font color. Um, CSS has built into it a bunch of human readable colors. Um, it also has built into it the ability to work with any hex color you want. So if I say um, 45, 73, 23, I can get some sort of weird green color. Oh, it's not even that different from. <laughs> what I just came up with. Um, this is RGB. So if I do 
Um, if I do everything on, I get black. If I do um, 10, 10, 10, that's also, anyways, you can do color. Um, an important thing that we're going to see is um, we can declare classes of styling uh, that is very common in scraping that we'll want to use those. So notice that I have, if I come back here and I refresh the page, what I entered in the dev tools is gone. So what we actually want to do is specify this in the actual markup. So I'll come back to my particle HTML. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to include uh, styling information inside the head of the, the document. So we're going to add a tag here, um, the style tag. And um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and make a, for the sake of this exercise, let's make a list that we can color in different ways. So I'm going to say, I'm going to make another tag. So based on your content, find something that you can make a list out of. So I'm going to say, uh, why learn HTML? So I'm going to uh, use a, uh, a unordered list, a UL. So an unordered list will become bullets. And then I'm going to make individual list items that we're going to try adding some classes to. So uh, why learn HTML? Um, and I'm just going to make a couple of list items. Okay, so uh, what I've done is I've made a unordered list of a few items. So I'm going to put that over here so you can keep working on that and see if it um, okay. So I that turned into a an, a uh, bulleted list. Now, let's imagine, and we're gonna, this is where we're going to bridge into Python. I'm going to create a classification scheme for these list items, and I'm going to try to scrape them out of my web page with Python. So what we're going to do is a very common uh, pattern that you'll see in web pages is almost every element will be given a class. So I'm going to design a set of classes that, um, uh, that, that rank order these, uh, these reasons. So let's say, um, uh, let's say class critical. And Actually, I'll have a of class uh, neat. It's neato, but this is critical. And adding values to organizations is also critical. And um, this is class uh, critical. So what I'm doing is I am differentiating my list items by putting them in their own classes. Uh, and now notice the HTML markup doesn't care what the class is. The class can be any valid characters inside of your class tab. What we'll, what we'll use is if we match up the class names, we can style it, 
consistently, and then we can use the fact that they have classes as uh, a way to scrape. So I can add another list item. Um, so maybe this is because uh, playing with Okay, so let's imagine now that I want to make all of my critical items red and all of my neato items blue. So I'm going to scroll up to my style sheet and I'm going to say, uh, and then this is CSS. So what CSS says is you specify classes with a period. So I can say any element that is of class neato should have the color blue. Any class that is of class critical should be colored red. And so I'm going to uh, scroll this out. I'm actually going to flip these. So you can see that on one page. So now if I save this, look at that. Is that neat or what? So raise your hand once you've gotten a class system to work with your style sheet and your classified items. Great, and again, um, message out if you're having problems. Um, you'll see this is very meaningful because if without this primer, you will not be able to understand the documentation for Beautiful Soup. I almost guarantee it. This is neat stuff. Um, can if there's anything we can do to help, just let us know. I'm going to, while I'm doing that, uh, some of you that are uh, color inclined, there's a cool website called uh, Paladon that allows you to build neat color schemes. Um, so these are kind of, these are very 90s colors, but what if I want to come up with some neat, uh, um, let's have a better, like a better blue and a, So I could come here and say, I can grab this color. So if you prefix the color with a uh, an octothorpe is what the hashtag is called, um, you can give it any arbitrary six digit hexadecimal value um, and now the colors with that green kind of washed out And so this is why people like web design because um, you can play with, you, you can start styling uh, infinitely, infinitely uh, specifically. Okay, any questions before we move on to Beautiful Soup? Those of you that don't have your hands raised, is there anything I can help with? Do you know you're doing okay out there? Oh, great. Okay, so um, now there's a library called Beautiful Soup that will allow you to read in an entire web page and grab individual elements 
in single lines of Python. So let's go ahead and give this a try. So um, one of the things that we can do is use my, uh, we're going to use a, um, uh, a website for practice that's a little bit more complicated. So now we've seen the element, the rudiments, and it'll help you navigate around um, a more complicated website. So let's go back to our scraping page and uh, beautiful soup is linked on number two on our resources. And uh, I'd also like you to open up goodreads.com, which I think was bought up by Amazon, um, which is a, 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 book, a book browsing, book record site. So Beautiful Soup, it, it's a little bit heavy. Look at this. Ah, so much. But really at its base is giving us a chance to read in an HTML document that now we understand a bit and we can uh, ask it to reconstruct the uh, to reconstruct the document inside its own memory. Um, one of the things that I want to bring out here for just a second is the idea that based on the file that we just designed, um, we can think of it as a as a tree. Um, and so I am going to jump back to my uh, draw.io. So one of the things that we'll see in the documentation is that the relationship between elements is often described in Beautiful Soup in terms of the uh, document tree. And so what that means is I'm talking and navigating at the same time, which is bad practice. So uh, the way to think about this parse as a tree is the body of the page forms the root node of a tree. So we would say that uh, body is the root, and then every element that is nested inside of another element becomes a child of its nested parent. So what that means is, I've got inside body, what do I have? I have an H1 tag. And is there anything nested inside the H1 tag? Yes, there's actually the way that Beautiful Soup will think about it is that there is a text node that we see only as text, but Beautiful Soup will think of this as a text node, so underneath H1's parent is text node that contains this text. So one of the things that, we'll, that you'll do in Beautiful Soup is you'll be asking it, go find me the headers and then give me the, the text inside of that header. So uh, all of this we'll be doing in Python in just a second and I don't want you to be overwhelmed. So again, we're drawing a tree that looks like this. Now, it, there's nothing else inside H1. You'll notice that this unordered list is at the same level as H1, meaning it's they're both nested. Their parent is both body. So that means that the uh, UL tag is going to be a what of H1. Where's our tree people? What do we call the UL? It is the what of the H1 in tree language, family language. I think I heard it. Sibling? Did I hear it? So because these both have the same parent, so elements with same parent are siblings. Um, to prove to you that I'm not crazy, look at the documentation. Um, one of the ways that you'll be able to get stuff is notice how you're actually Content in children, a tag children are available 
in a list called contents. So that's why we're doing all of this is because if you don't have a sense of what on earth a tree is, you'll have no idea why there's children running around your documentation. Um, so the H1 and the unordered list are both the children of body. Now these list items are, their parent is the UL. So here I would need to have how many, it has how many kids, three, four, five kids. So this list item has Oh, come on, you stupid thing. Line, middle, distribute, horizontal. Oh, well. Um, so these list items are all siblings of this H1. Will this distribute it now? Yes. So we're building, so when we read this page in to Beautiful Soup, it is going to be, what it's doing in the background is it's building the entire, it's called the document object model tree or the DOM tree. And so we will then be parsing it like a tree if we want to get to fancy things. So these would all go out here like this. And then what are the children of all of these? So here we would have, on this element, we'd have class um, Nito. And so we could be saying, get me all of the children of the UL whose class is uh, Nito or critical. See how we're, we're building this out? And then the text node, these all have text nodes down here, which I won't make you come out and see. So this is a okay. Cool trees are everywhere, not just outside anymore. Okay, so what uh, what I want to do in Python is I'd like to see if we could use scraping to figure out uh, how what kinds of books are associated with a given keyword. So let's, I'm just gonna get my windows organized here. So I'm going to make a new uh, Python script. And I'm gonna say, um, Okay, so what I want to have now is I'm going to start by going to the website whose data I, I want to scrape. So let's just see how Goodreads works. Goodreads allows you to search by topic, so I could say virus. Mm. Boo, go away, Amazon. Oh, I can't believe they do that. I can. I can believe they do that. Everyone does that. So uh, I just did a search. The first thing you want to do when you find a site is F12 and see what it looks like. What is this? What's the HTML look like? <clears throat> Meaning, uh, one of the key things you're going to want to do is there's an inspector tool on your um, on your Dev Tools. It's in the upper left. It's also available with Control Shift C. So if I want to pull a list of all the titles of books that have the word that come up with the keyword virus, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by clicking the thing that I think I want to scrape with Python. So I'm going to click that title and see what it looks like in HTML. So notice this is a much more complicated page than we built, and it's complicated because it's being built by a HTML parser machine and not by someone hand coding it. So what I'm looking at is do I have classes that are um, 
that correspond roughly with something useful. And it looks like right here, um, the book itself, the title is also a link. There's our A link. And it is of class book title, which is nice. Um, but what's even better is look at this. This has the unmuddled title. The Hot Zone, The Terrifying True Story Origins of the Ebola Virus. So what I'm thinking in my head is um, item prop. This has a... Um, this is a, called a custom class, and I know this just because I know HTML. This, this is a, or sorry, custom uh, attribute. Item prop is not an HTML standard attribute. Uh, whoever made Goodreads built that. But class is a custom, is, is, a, is a standard attribute. So what I'm thinking in my head is, if I could grab all of the anchors, that have the class book title, I see that they have a kid who's this span element. And the only thing in this span element, span is, is just like a way of, of um, formatting a particular portion of text. Um, if I can grab the span element that is the child of the anchors with class book title, I can then get the text of the book title. Um, it's going to be easier at your first pass to use um, attributes that are standard HTML, like class, um, than using item prop. It's still possible, but it's better to start with class. So in my head, I'm thinking, self, great day. This looks like a pretty scrapable thing. And I'm going to just double check uh, to look, make sure that each of the items on here gets me... Uh, is, is formatted in a similar way. So one of the nice things to note is this is all part of a big table. Uh, I know that because TD is a table data tag, and it's all part of this great big table, and tables are a mess. Tables in HTML are a grand, a grand mess from a parsing standpoint, so much so that Pandas actually created a whole script just to parse tables. Um, but if you don't know how to do it by hand, you won't know if Pandas is doing it right or not. So um, I have, I've put out my little schema in my head of, okay, if I can grab my anchor tags and then grab the spans, I could then list out the titles and then I could run some machine learning and get positive or negative sentiments. I could analyze for frequency of words or I could look for author and, and do number of authors or author gender, inferred author gender, that kind of thing. So um, this is looking pretty good. And the other thing that I like about Goodreads is the UR, it's a URL encoded search. Um, so I can come up here just like I did with the API and I can just tinker with it a bit and say, well, I see my search term virus up there. If I change it to Python, does it in fact do what I expect, which is search for books with the word Python? Ah, yes, it does. So um, my two checks are in place, which is the URL encoding is, is simple, and the HTML of the content that I want is relatively uh, clean. So I can uh, come in here and start my scraping script. So I'm just gonna do a little, uh, a little commentary here. So, uh, scraping demo for DAT129 before scraping a page check. Let's do this. to
what I'm looking for is distinctive uh, class names or tag names. Um, so if, if we pass both of those checks, um, we're going to go ahead and start our scraping process. 